All right, Joe, so 7.6. Uh, coming close to the end of Unit 7, there's only uh, eight sections altogether. So this is looking at trade in the world economy. Uh, and so just how goods tend to flow around the world uh, and some of the issues that surround that. And so uh, let's go ahead and get into it, maybe. All right, there we go. So uh, here's the four things that we'll be looking at. Uh, but again, we're looking, here's kind of the, the primary thing. Economic and social development happen at different times and different rates in different places. And so uh, with the growth models, we saw that as well. So let's take a look first, uh, just at the basic question of why countries actually trade with each other. Uh, because, you know, you, you might say, hey, wouldn't the U.S. be better off if we just made all this stuff ourselves? Uh, and we could make most of it ourselves, but it would be really, really expensive. So let's uh, tick off a couple of these. So uh, some of the resources that we can get. Uh, remember, we talked about Democratic Republic of Congo uh, having all of the cobalt to mine, and the cobalt is used in lithium batteries. And so, you know, I'm not sh aware we might have a cobalt industry in the U.S., but it's nothing like what's in uh, DRC. And so, you know, being able to trade allows us to get those resources that we might otherwise wouldn't get. And so without the cobalt, we don't have lithium batteries. Without the lithium batteries, we don't have our cell phones. And so, you know, that the trade in that respect is extremely beneficial for us. A uh, greater variety of goods. People produce different things around the world. Increased competition and efficiency. This means that the price of things tends to come down. Uh, so we as consumers benefit because of a lower price. Uh, it does promote more economic growth and development. Uh, we specialize in certain industries and we grow those and other countries specialize in other industries and they grow those. And so there's an overall greater level of, of economic growth and development. Uh, the flow of new ideas, this is a big one. You know, we, somebody might have an idea somewhere and then somebody else can use that idea and build something else. And then somebody can take that and build something else. And so you've heard the phrase, hopefully standing on the shoulders of giants, kind of the same thing with the new ideas, you know, uh, other people create something and then you create something off of that. So, uh, and then reduction of international hostilities. This is, you know, not necessarily often seen. It's hard to put a dollar value on this, but it's, it's very, very real. The more countries trade with each other, there's an economic benefit. Uh, both countries are benefiting because remember, here's one of the big uh, rules of trade. If it's voluntary trade, both sides are benefiting, okay? Uh, if you ever buy something from somebody uh, and you say, hey, I took advantage of them because they sold it to me dirt cheap. If it was voluntary, they benefited, all right? And so always remember that. And so, you know, if, if two countries are trading with one another, uh, then they are both getting a benefit out of it. And therefore any kind of hostility that, that would be, uh, that could arise, they have to start to weigh that with, okay, how much benefit am I getting by trading by, you know, what would I be losing if, if I, I started these hostilities with another country that I'm currently trading with? And so it does help maintain the peace. And so, you know, looking at all of this, uh, all these reasons, and, and there's more, but uh, looking at all of these, you know, that, that's a pretty compelling argument to trade with each other, okay? Uh, again, we could do it all ourselves, but then we lose out. We could do most of it ourselves because we don't have every resource out there. Uh, but we just, we, we are much better off. Now, there are some downsides, and we'll talk about those as well. All right, so a couple of terms here. The first is complementarity. All right, and so this is looking at trade, and all complementarity says is that uh, two countries trade, and if each has something that the other wants, there's a greater benefit, and they'll trade even more. All right, and so if you look at trade between the U.S., uh, here's the stuff. So we bring in, we buy 243.3, I'm sorry, we sell $243.3 .3 billion worth of stuff to Mexico, all right? And so that's that's money coming into us that we sell to that, that from goods we sell to them. And then Mexico uh, sells us $315 billion worth of stuff. So we've got 315 billion US dollars going out and 243 billion US dollars coming in. And just to foreshadow a little bit, uh, this is what they call a trade deficit. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, there's some debate there, but we'll get into that later. But uh, take a look. Here's the different stuff that we import and export. Uh, so machinery, including electrical. So think of, you know, all the all the big tools that are used in factories. You know, those might come from here. Uh, the Caterpillar uh, earth-moving machines, those would come from here. And so we have something they want, uh, and then they produce different machinery, all right? And so we produce different things and we like what the other produces and so we trade. And that's what we mean by complementarity, all right? Uh, so I'm not sure which year this was. Hang on, let me move that. So this, this is from 2017. Uh, it's changed a little bit, but not a whole lot. 
All right, so the bigger concept that you need to be familiar with is this thing called comparative advantage. This is very much an economics uh, uh, concept. So comparative advantage, it, it's trying to figure out which country should produce what, all right? And so again, if you look at the US, we used to produce a lot of clothing here, a lot of shirts, things like that, uh, textiles. And so we don't do that anymore. If you look in your closet, uh, you're not gonna find much, if anything, made in the United States. Uh, but if you go to your bathroom and look at like, uh, toothpaste and shampoo and all that kind of stuff, you're going to find that most of it was made either in the U.S. or Canada or France or England, uh, one of the more developed countries. And so uh, there's a reason that those countries that we focus on different things, and it is in large part because of this idea of comparative advantage. And so here's, here's kind of the thought. So this is from the BMW factory, and I've talked about this uh, before, and I use it a lot because I've, I used to take my students to this factory, and it, it was incredible. Uh, lesson on, on a lot of different levels. So uh, this is a woman working at the BMW factory in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And let's say that she gets paid $60,000 a year. They do pretty well. Uh, and this is a seamstress from Bangladesh. And she might earn $1,000. All right. And so here's the idea of comparative advantage. We could, we could do this job. We could do the shirts. But it would mean that we would have to stop because we have available limited resources, limited availability of resources. And so we can't do it all. And so we would have to possibly shut down this job in order to do that job. All right. And so now we'd be losing out on this $60,000 job that we could have to go to a thousand dollar job or whatever the, the equivalent here would be. Uh, and it would be a lot less. And so uh, you'll see this phrase in the, in the definition here, lower opportunity costs. And so if we look at what would we have to give up in order to produce something in the U.S.? So what would we have to give up in order to produce shirts in the U.S.? We would have to give up a job at a BMW factory earning 60 grand. And that's a really big cost. You know, the cost to make that shirt would be all of this money that you could have made making BMWs. And so, uh, you know, if you look at the opportunity cost for uh, the people working in this factory, you know, what are they giving up in order to work in the factory? And the answer is not nearly, not a lot, okay? Uh, this is their best opportunity right now, possibly, and this is this person's best opportunity right now, possibly. And so, you know, what you would give up is, is has to be taken into consideration. And so, again, when you look at the stuff that we produce in the U.S., a lot of it is high dollar kind of stuff. And so if we wanted to switch and say, okay, let's produce something else like shirts, we would be giving up the opportunity to produce a very high dollar value product, all right? And so when you look around the world at, at who's producing what, it is based off of this idea of comparative advantage, all right? When we look at the countries that produce shirts, uh, they are countries that don't have a large tech, tech, technology center. Uh, they're not technologically driven to the degree that develop more developed economies are, and so they just they would give up, they have to give up less in order to produce this, uh, in order to produce the stuff, and so that's kind of what comparative advantage is all about. And so when you look at you know why are all your clothes in your closet made in Vietnam or Thailand or Bangladesh or Honduras or Guatemala, uh, then that's the reason, and your chemicals are produced in uh, the U.S. or Canada or France or England. That's the reason, okay? It's all about opportunity cost, all righty? Uh, so a couple of uh, terms here. So when we look at trade today, it is based on this idea of what they call neoliberal policies. And neoliberalism basically means get the government out of it, all righty? Uh, and so here's, here's the thought. Uh, neoliberalism liberalism would mean to eliminate any kind of price control, so any kind of government price control, deregulating the money and so you can, you, your money can flow from one country to another. Uh, you can invest, if there's a business in Mexico you want to invest in, you can send your money down there. They could send their money up here. You know, get the, get the governments out of, uh, out of the money market, basically. And then lowering trade barriers, you know, get rid of all the tariffs, uh, get rid of the quotas, and we'll talk about what, what that is, uh, or all the different regulations. And so make it easier for countries to trade. All right, now, there's reasons that there are regulations, and we shouldn't forget that, uh, but that's what that's the idea of neoliberalism. And so neoliberalism has kind of been throughout the globe, certainly since uh, after World War II, you know, with the idea that we should trade more. Uh, and when we talk about free trade, let's just be clear here, free trade means uh, 
generally that there is a lack of tariffs or a reduction, but hope, you know, ideally uh, zero tariffs on products coming in. And remember, a tariff is simply a tax on imports. Uh, and so when you hear the term free trade, that is the dropping or easing off of, of tariffs. All right. And so all these op all these different things that we're about to look at, EU, World Trade, WTO, uh, Mercosur, and OPEC, all of these have led to greater globalization and much greater interdependence among one another. Because when you join like these trade groups like the EU, uh, this is, you know, this makes countries much more dependent because the specialization within each country increases further because they can trade more. And as you specialize more, that means you're producing less variety. And so you need the other countries to, to, to give you that variety. And you actually get a lot more variety with, with the trade. So uh, think about, you know, this is globalization and this is interdependence. All right, so let's look at these uh, real quick. Uh, so the USMCA, uh, this is formerly known as NAFTA. This is a trade agreement between the US, Mexico. So US, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, and so this has lowered trade barriers and you know it's, it's got a lot to it, but uh, this is just a free trade agreement between those three countries. And we trade a lot with each other. Uh, I think Canada's our second biggest and Mexico's our third biggest trade partner uh, behind, uh, behind China. Uh, and China just recently took over that number one spot. But anyway, so uh, that's one of them. The European Union, and we've talked about this before. Uh, here's their goals. I'm not going to read these to you. You can just look at them, pause it and look at them. Uh, here's all the EU countries. Travel's made easier, all that kind of stuff. They're on uh, single currency, the euro. Whoops, I drew that wrong. Uh, the euro. And so the single currency makes trade a lot easier. And so uh, this has, you know, this market, by the way, is about equivalent to what the U.S. market is. Okay, in terms of people, uh, it's a little bit less in terms of GDP. But uh, when you think about the EU, it, it's it's fair to co compare it to the United States as a whole market. All right, and so they do have a lot of power as a group because they can negotiate with with other other countries or other uh, other groups to to try to get what they want. So anyway, uh, and here's kind of another thing: uh, member countries in the EU. Uh, can borrow from the EU to help during a recession. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about Greece in just a bit, uh, but Greece has been going through some economic troubles. And so they've gone and the European Union has been lending them money to try to keep them afloat. Uh, so anyway, we'll talk about that in just a bit. Uh, so the World Trade Organization, their goal, so the World Trade Organization, copied and pasted that one, uh, that should be a Z, uh, the body through which governments and businesses negotiate the rules of trade settle trade disputes uh, once these rules have been established. And so all the rules that the, that the countries play by in terms of international trade are in the, in the World Trade Organization. And the WTO is the group, if there's a conflict between, say, the US and Canada uh, over some kind of trade thing, we, those countries would take it to the WTO and they would get, the WTO would be the judge of, of that. And they would decide uh, who, who wins or whatever. Uh, and then both countries would abide by that ruling. All right. Uh, so that's WTO. Uh, you can see most countries are, are members of the WTO. Uh, we have observers there, very few non-members. Right. Uh, Mercosur uh, is uh, the trading block in South America. So you can see this. Uh, the full membership is here. Uh, so Brazil, Paraguay, International, Uruguay, or International, Argentina, Uruguay. Uh, and then we have associate members. So it's, it's basically all of this. Uh, the, you can see Venezuela got suspended in 2016. But again, uh, this group is uh, to tr try to negotiate free trade agreement uh, with one another and then act as a group to uh, negotiate trade agreements with other countries. So right now, you know, you can see that they're trying to get a trade free trade agreement with China. Uh, and, you know, taking a look at this, uh, here's the GDP of the different countries. So Brazil's the biggest by far, Argentina's uh, about a fourth of what Brazil is, and then there's the others. And then there's population correlations as well. But uh, so Mercosur is this free trade group uh, that, that tries, it's, and it's just, it's more than just free trade. But uh, anyway, OPEC, we've talked about them just a bit, Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries. So their main goal is to control oil supply in the world. And so if you look at what they control, they control about a third of the world's supply, which is a lot. Okay, so it's these 12 countries, I think it's 12, uh, these 12 countries. And so the idea would be that if the price of oil 
uh, and therefore gas. You know, a lot of things come from crude oil, but uh, we'll just focus on gas. So let's say that the price of gas dropped down to a dollar a gallon. We as consumers think, hey, this is awesome. But these countries rely heavily on that and they would want to jack the price back up. And so since they control such a large amount and a third of the supply under control of one group is a terribly large amount, uh, then they could cut the supply. And if there's less of it, uh, this price would start to go up. And so we can see today it's around three bucks a gallon here in Tucson. Uh, and it's in part because of the supply and the demand. Demand's picking up as well because we're hopefully looks like we might be coming out of COVID uh, at some point. So, but anyway, it's, it's these uh, 12 countries and they seek to stabilize the oil markets. Uh, and that's one word. Control is another word. So, uh, but do take note, the U.S., is now one of the world's largest uh, producers of oil. Russia is a very large producer of oil. And so, you know, there are other places to get oil, but to have a third of the control, a third of the supply is, is a fair amount. Uh, and so one of the potential conflicts that we get from all this trade uh, is this idea of the trade deficit. And again, a trade deficit is when imports are greater than exports. And we're talking about the dollar values, not... Uh, not the actual number of goods, but the dollar values. And so you can see uh, 2014, uh, this is what we imported and this is what we exported to China. Uh, 2019 was a huge drop because we had started a trade war with China. Uh, but here's the thought uh, that with a trade deficit, you have 468 billion US dollars going into China and only 123 billion coming back. And so there's this notion that, hey, we gave them $344 billion more than they gave us, all right? And so this is bad in one sense uh, because the money's not coming back necessarily directly. However, if you think about it in a, in a technical term, we've given them American dollars. What's the only thing they can do with American dollars? And that is basically buy American stuff. And so they're not necessarily buying our goods and services. They may lend us money. Uh, we owe China about a trillion dollars thereabouts uh, because they've taken some of this surplus and uh, lent it to our government uh, because our government's borrowing is as of now the safest place on earth to invest oddly enough uh, so but anyway so uh, these aren't necessarily bad because remember we're buying this stuff because it's a lot cheaper you know it, they can produce it cheaper than we can and so we buy it from them and so you know, we're, we're buying the stuff and we have money left over that we wouldn't have if we had just made it ourselves. And so now it allows us to uh, be able to buy other things or save our money or whatever you want to do with it. Uh, but it, it, it would improve our standard of living in that respect. In the opposite respect, uh, it would be nice if they would use some of this money to buy more of our stuff, because if they're buying more of our stuff, that creates a, a higher demand for U.S. products, which helps with uh, employment. Okay, and so there's there's good arguments on both sides here. Uh, looking at creation of indus, industrial regions, so there are a few different types. All right, uh, so uh, and we'll get to those different types in just a second. But I want to look at what the government can do to help economic development. And this is by no means an all-inclusive list, but uh, they can do infrastructure development. Biden's trying to put together like a two trillion dollar infrastructure package right now. Uh, they can maintain a stable currency. You know, uh, the U.S., we take it for granted, but the U.S. dollar is, is stable, one of the most stable currencies in the world. And that's not an accident. That didn't just happen. And so uh, the government, the Federal Reserve, which you may or may not know about, uh, they have a large part in maintaining the stable currency, the, the stability of the country, uh, the stable financial institutions, so our banks, things like that, uh, creating conditions for economic opportunity. Is it easy to go out and start up a business, that kind of thing? And so uh, countries can can do all these different things. And so you can see this is an index of economic freedom. The more freedom generally, uh, the faster a country grows. There's other issues around it. It's not just all about growth, remember that. But uh, so you can see uh, we are mostly free here. Looks like Australia comes in at the freest, I guess. Uh, but you know, the economic freedom is, is one of those things that, that, that countries need to some degree. All right, countries with very, very limited freedom are controlled by the government. And the government controlling the economy is probably not the best idea, uh, as we saw with the Soviet Union uh, and Venezuela today. All right, uh, we've got issues. Don't you know that, that's that's very true. Uh, but having some level of economic freedom and stability is part of this. Stability is huge. If you're a company and you're trying to figure out, hey, should I put my factory here, uh, or should I put my factory, say, 
here, you're going to go with the, the more stable place uh, and cost plays a part. Now, protectionist measures also play a part in uh, economic development. And so, you know, if we want to protect certain industries in the U.S., we can throw up big tariffs on all these products coming in, which makes the U.S. product uh, cheaper relatively speaking. Uh, so the U.S. can put tariffs on foreign products. They can limit the number. That's what a quota is. Uh, they can limit the number of products coming in. They can subsidize domestic industries, so they can just give money to farmers or, or whoever, whatever business is here, and that makes their product cheaper, and then they can compete easier with the rest of the world. Uh, and then they can put up what they call non-tariff barriers. Okay, These are things like health, uh, health standards, environmental standards, can't spray certain pesticides on fruits or vegetables, stuff like that. Uh, that would be an example of a non-tariff barrier. And so all those are actions that the government can take. Uh, now, do take note of this. Protectionist measures hurt domestic consumers and it hurts foreign companies because it makes the price of foreign products higher. Uh, they are designed to help the domestic, whoops, the domestic companies here. All right. So any type of protectionist measures designed to help the, the, the companies within that country. All right. Uh, so actually, we're going to skip over that. All right. So let's look at interdependency real quick. Uh, economic social development uh, happened at different times and rates in different places. We've talked about that. Uh, global financial crises like debt or disease can spread far and wide. And so the economic impact of COVID uh, is, is it's going to take a while for us to understand the true economic impact, the, the negative impact that COVID has had. Uh, unemployment rates have soared, production, you know, went way down. And so that is, and that can, that obviously spreads worldwide. Uh, debt, if one country has a, what we call a debt crisis, we'll look in just a second, that can have ripple effects throughout the world economy. So uh, we are definitely, definitely uh, much more interdependent today. There's reasons that, you know, if, if Mexico were to uh, go into a debt crisis, the U.S. would probably want to stop that from happening. Not out of the, just the compassion uh, that's in our hearts, but out of an economic sense that if something really bad happens to Mexico, uh, go back to this, oops, that's too far. Go back to this, uh, you know, they're buying $243 billion worth of our stuff, and then you have, you know, uh, the unrest that might come. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of reasons, uh, financial reasons, that one country might bail out another one if they're going through a, a debt problem. So uh, let's look at these real quick. So global financial crises, like a debt crisis, uh, international lending agencies, and strategy of, strategies of development demonstrate how different economies have become more closely connected. So let's look at what a debt crisis is. It is when a government, all right, loses the ability to pay back its government debt. And we've looked in our class a bit, our current debt is about $28 trillion. But right now, it seems like we can maintain paying it back. And people are still lending us money, so they think we can pay it back. All right, so when the expenditures, so this is spending, expenditures equals spending. So when the spending of a, of a government is more than the tax revenues, so this is what they bring in, all right, spending and then received in taxes, uh, for a prolonged period, the government may in, enter into a debt crisis. Uh, and so if we're spending, you know, let's make it simple. If we're spending 100 and we are uh, raising $80 in taxes, that means that we have what they call a deficit of $20. All right. And so what if we can't pay this back? That's when we get into a problem. Because if we can't pay it back, nobody's going to lend us any more money. And so we got to figure out $20 to shave off of that. And so that that's when things start to get bad. And because, you know, 100 down to 80 is not a big deal. If we're talking about the U.S. economy at, you know, current rate of $6 trillion spending down to $4 trillion or whatever we're going to take it to, uh, that's a lot. And so here's some of the consequences. So definitely financial losses, market turmoil, uh, sharp slowdowns in trade, economic growth, very high unemployment. Uh, and so even these small countries, like I alluded to earlier, uh, and Mexico's not small, uh, but smaller countries uh, can cause ripple effects throughout the world and can, uh, and can cause serious global economic problems. There was a uh, debt problem in Thailand in 1997, I think it was, and that had ripple effects, it was called contagion, uh, that had ripple effects around the world uh, because you had, uh, just real quick, you know, let's say we have a U.S. bank and they lend money to people in Thailand. If Thailand can't pay it back, now this U.S. bank has got problems. And what if that's your bank? 
right? And so, you know, the, the, the global globalization of banking is a good thing, uh, but it does carry with it high risks because now this one player uh, across the world can have a direct impact on your bank, all right? Uh, and so let's take a look, and we're almost done, uh, at what would happen if the U.S. went into a debt crisis. So as of today, here's our debt, $28.1 trillion. That's a lot. Here's how much we're bringing in in taxes for the year. And so we're in uh, April of 2021. And so we're, you know, just went through a year's worth of spending for COVID, but $6.7 trillion spent for uh, this year. We brought in $3.4 trillion, $3.5 trillion. And so we have a deficit of $3.245 trillion. And so we we get this money so here's the actual cash we have here is the spending and so we are 3.2 million dollars short and we get that from borrowing anybody can lend us money other countries about a third of our debt so here's our total debt 28 trillion and to get the debt you add up all of the deficits all the yearly deficits uh and so you know if you take about if you look at this 28 trillion about a third of it is owned to foreign countries uh, like I said, and I'd have to check, you know, at least a year or so ago, we owed China about a trillion, I think Japan about it, or South Korea about a trillion, you know, and so we do owe other countries money, but a lot of this is, is uh, debt, about two thirds is debt owned to American owned companies or just individuals. So uh, here's what would happen. Uh, government programs have to be slashed. And so here's where the money goes. This is 2019. But Social Security, older people rely in part on that for retirement. So you could cut that. Medicare, that's health care for 65 and older. Income Security, this is unemployment benefits. Uh, that would be tough to cut because people rely on that if they lose their job to buy food, pay the rent. Uh, Medicaid is health care for the uh, low income. Veterans benefits, those are the soldiers uh, that, that are now uh, now require you know, health health. Uh, health expenses, sorry, uh, and then some other stuff. And so, you know, we could slash government programs, but what are you going to slash? You know, all of these are are, are important, clearly. Uh, we could slash the military. Military is about $724 billion. Uh, that's not terribly popular because it's the military. You know, they keep us safe. Uh, and so, you know, when we talk about where do we, you know, stop spending, that gets tough. Uh, because politicians don't like making those tough decisions. So here's some of the other stuff that can happen. And by the way, this this kind of happened in 2008. Uh, they were able to stop it before it went into a full blown depression. Uh, but they call it, it it's called the Great Recession. Okay, it wasn't the depression uh, because they were able to fix it beforehand. But uh, it is the Great Recession. So bank lending. So if we have this debt crisis, bank lending is going to start to freeze up. Banks are going to stop lending money. Uh, and so that's an issue because a lot of times businesses often use these short-term loans from banks to make their payments to their employees to pay their to pay their employees to make payroll. Uh, and so if that stops, businesses can't make payroll. Uh, businesses, you know, as a worker, now you can't pay if you're not getting paid, you can't pay your bills. And so uh, businesses will go out of business, uh, and all these people will now become unemployed. And by the way, that unemployment makes this number, this income security, go up. You know, when we're trying to uh, actually make make debt go down, uh, the housing market. You know, if banks aren't lending, you know, people stop buying houses, so the housing values go way down. Car sales go down. Anything that you would borrow money for tends to go down, and so you'd have this huge economic uh, crisis, high unemployment. Uh, the interest rates to buy stuff are going to skyrocket. Uh, it's just not good, you know. And so if we were to try to, if you know, if we were to to go to a balanced budget. So here's three and a half trillion dollars over here. If we were to try to get to spending of three and a half trillion, we'd have to figure out how to cut three point two trillion dollars. You know, and again, you got you'd have to hit all of these programs because that's a lot of money. And so, you know, these these debt crises can be extremely bad for for countries. Uh, and so here's just a, a real quick list: countries with the largest national debt burdens. And so this is as percentage of their GDP. And so remember, our GDP is twenty one trillion dollars. And so you know, any if a hundred percent of our GDP would be a twenty one trillion dollar debt. And so we're actually above it, which is not generally considered a good thing. But uh, so you can see, Japan has the highest, you know, relative to their economy. Uh, Sudan. Greece. And so we use these percentages instead of numbers because it wouldn't be fair to compare the U.S. debt. The U.S. has the highest debt in the world in terms of dollars, but in terms of proportion to its economy, it's it's not as high. 
Uh, so, you know, comparing it to Sudan would be silly in terms of dollars, but looking at percentages definitely is, is good. So Greece is at 171, uh, Lebanon 161. So you can see that. Uh, and we are now up there. Uh, I didn't do the, the math before I started this, but, you know, if we're at 28 trillion, we have a $21 trillion economy. That's, that's getting up into this range for sure. Uh, so anyway, I think let me get rid of that. Is that it? Oh, nope, last a little bit. So we do have a couple of international lending agencies. Uh, these were created after World War II uh, to kind of help get uh, the economic, you know, the international economic order uh, going. And so we have two groups called the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and then the World Bank. And so the IMF, uh, it's 190 member countries, and they here's their goals. Uh, global monetary cooperation, financial stability, facilitate trade, promote high employment, uh, sustain economic growth, and reduce poverty. So those are all good goals. There is some criticism of the IMF because if they go and lend money uh, to a country, they'll tell the country, you have to do this, this, and this in order to get the loan. And so sometimes the countries are like, well, that's, that's stupid because if we follow that, we're going to have even bigger problems. And so uh, there is some, some debate as to uh, how effective they are, uh, but they are uh, an important player right now. S similar to the World Bank, these two folks are right across the street from each other in the U.S., by the way. Uh, here's So the World Bank makes loans uh, to countries, and here's their goals. Uh, promote or end hunger, uh, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, uh, promote education, gender equality, uh, reduce child mortality. Uh, and so you can see all these different ones, all these different uh, goals that the World Bank has. Similar to the IMF, but a little bit different. All right. Uh, and this is the last slide. So there is a phrase out there, and it can apply more uh, to just the U more than just to the U.S. right now. But uh, there was this phrase out uh, that says, "When the U.S. sneezes, the whole world catches a cold." And the the idea behind this is that you know the the U.S. economy is the biggest economy on earth. Uh, you know, it's a twenty one trillion dollar economy, and we buy products from all over the world. We sell products all over the world. Our lending goes all over the world. I mean, you name it. Uh, and, and, and other countries as well, China's there, uh, the, the EU countries, same kind of thing. And so this is just saying, look, if one country gets sick, then the other countries are going to get sick. Because if, if, US, if the U.S. goes into a high level of unemployment, uh, think about what that does to Chinese exports to the U.S. Makes it go way down. Uh, we stop buying stuff from Europe. We stop buying stuff from Asia. Uh, we stop buying as much stuff from South America. And so when we stop buying stuff, that affects their economies. And so now they've caught the same thing that we've got. Okay. So that's it for that. Uh, see you next time.